Father, we do want to come and just, again, make it our business, make it our priority to really worship you, to see the name of Jesus Christ and to see the glory of God just exalted in this place. So we really do want to worship you. We really do want to lift up and extol your name here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
unto you. Even as Peter said, Lord, that we would indeed roll out the red carpet for you, Lord Jesus, to come, to speak, to reveal, to do what you need to do. 
But may we have our hearts open and able to receive all that you would say. In Jesus' name, amen. Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 21 to 23. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses or mercies indeed never cease, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The contemporary English version puts it like this. Then I remember something that fills me with hope. The Lord's kindness never fails. If He had not been merciful, we would have been destroyed. The Lord can always be trusted to show mercy every morning. In the midst of what is one of the most gloomy and down books of the whole Bible, uh, and it's interesting to note, I, I, I only saw this morning, the original Hebrew name for the book of Lamentations is just simply, alas, <laughs> exclamation mark. <laughs> or, or they say you can also translate it as why. <laughs> we call it Lamentations. The, the Jews call it alas, or why. But in the midst of all of this gloom that there is in the book of Lamentations, suddenly there's hope. Jeremiah says, in the midst of all this, then I remember just this one thing, and it gives me great hope. The Lord's mercies are new every single morning. And even though I may fall horribly at times, even though I may be faithless on many occasions, even though my circumstances are beyond what I would have ever imagined, his compassions never fail, and His faithfulness is great. You see, right at the heart of everything in the old or under the old covenant, firstly with the tabernacle and later with the temple, all of Israel's spiritual life centered around the, the, the tabernacle, the temple later on, and the three uh, portions within the tabernacle or the temple, temple. We know that both had three parts. And right at the center of each one of those was a thing called the Holy of Holies. And at the center of the Holy of Holies, in turn, was the Ark of the Covenant. On top of the Ark was the place where God said to Moses in Exodus 25, 22, there, that's the place where I will meet with you and I'll speak to you. And the place where God met with Moses and spoke with Moses was a place called the mercy seat. We often think of the old covenant as all just rules and laws and judgment. But we need to really come into this truth this morning. That at the heart of the old covenant, central to it, the very place from which God spoke was a place called the mercy seat. It's significant in 1 Chronicles 28 verse 11, when David is giving to Solomon the plans for the temple, and he's talking about all the rooms and the storerooms and inner rooms. It simply says, and the room, not for the ark, but the room for the mercy seat. So there rested upon the ark, this solid plate of gold, which was called the mercy seat. It's mentioned 22 times in the Old Testament. And then as we come through into the New Testament, Hebrews 9 then takes up the whole thing of the mercy seat. And as you read it, it becomes clear that the Lord Jesus Christ is, in fact, the mercy seat. The mercy seat sitting on the ark of the Old Testament is just simply another aspect of the glory and the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you notice it's called the seat of mercy. And that very word mercy in the Old Testament is a very rich and it's a very strong word. 
It means the loving kindness of the Lord. That's why you find in the verses we read from Lamentations, some translations will say loving kindness, others will talk about mercy that are new every morning and that you, you don't ever run out of them. You might think you've used up all today's mercy or all today's loving kindness, but the word says tomorrow morning there's a whole new fresh dose for you. Mercy and loving kindness, they're interchangeable. And another translation of that Hebrew word is steadfast love, covenant love, loyal love, a covenant of love made through the blood that was sprinkled on the mercy seat. And it's a very, very impressive thing that right at the very center and heart of this whole great system of Old Testament worship, right at the heart of it all, is the mercy seat. Everything else pointed towards the mercy seat, and it gave its value to everything else. The mercy seat governed and gave character to everything. We have to realize that for us, the, as the people of God, it's not the judgment seat. It's the mercy seat that governs everything else. Psalm 84, that wonderful psalm all about the house of God. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. And then he comes into that glorious revelation in verse 10. Oh, oh my, just one day there in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. This sinful man, this poor failing man says, says this. Why is it that the poor, sinful, faltering man talks like that? Why is it that he so longs for the courts of the Lord's house? The answer is found in one little phrase. He knows that at the center of that house, right in the innermost of those courts of the Lord, is the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the ark are two things. Verse 11, the Lord gives grace and glory. Right at the heart of it all, that's where God gives grace and glory. And he's not exaggerating when he says it's better to just have one day in the presence of that grace and glory than to spend a thousand anywhere else. The throne of grace. The mercy seat, right at the very center of the house of the Lord. The glory represented by the golden cherubim. The grace represented by the mercy seat. Not a throne of judgment, a throne of grace. And it's glory. It's not shame that crowns the mercy seat. This man, as he writes this psalm, knows that there between the cherubim, hovering above the mercy seat, was where the Shekinah glory of God was. And then we find, we pass from the type, the picture, to the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. I said that in Hebrews 9, the Lord Jesus now takes the place of the mercy seat. Hebrews 9 verse 5. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat, there's the glory and the grace together. But of these things we sh cannot now speak in detail. And then if you go to Romans 3, verse 25, Jesus, whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation through faith by His blood. Now if you tell me what you know that long word propitiation means, I won't call you a liar, but I, I don't know that you really do. I'm not all that sure. It, it's something that should actually just pop your corks. There's a, a Greek word, hilasterion. It's only used twice in the whole of Scripture. Hilasterion. And the verses we just read are the only two places that are, where it's used in the whole of the Bible. Hebrews 9 verse 5. 
cherubim of glory overshadowing the hilasterion, the mercy seat. Cherubim of glory overshadowing the hilasterion. Romans 3 verse 25. Jesus, whom God set forth to be a hilasterion. A propitiation, what most of our modern translations say. In other words, Jesus, whom God set forth to be a mercy seat. The Young's literal translation gets it absolutely right. Romans 3.25 says, whom God did set forth a mercy seat. And again, the contemporary English version gets it even more spot on. Romans 3.25. God showed that Jesus Christ is the throne of mercy, where God's approval is given through faith in Christ's blood. In his patience, God waited to deal with sins committed in the past. Showed Jesus Christ is actually the throne of mercy. And so in the light of that, you can read 1 John 4, 10. Um, and it has a, a slightly different variation of that same word. But it's also translated in most of our English translations, again, into propitiation. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation, but has sent His Son to be the mercy seat for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, then we also ought to love one another. Jesus occupies the central place in this whole scheme of redemption. And that central place is a mercy seat. It was there at the mercy seat that God met with Moses, later met with people, sorry, with the people of Israel in the representative person of the high priest. You'll remember that when the high priest, Aaron and then other ones after him, went to the Ark of the Covenant, he had a breastplate on him with the names of all the tribes of Israel so that in the person of that high priest, all the people of God were represented, were present. And there at the mercy seat, God spoke and made himself known, revealed himself to his people. Aaron went in with the blood of sacrifice, sprinkled it on the mercy seat, making an atonement for the people. And through that covenant and blood, God made himself known. It was a perpetual testimony to the grace of God. Under the old covenant, that was once a year. But with our Lord Jesus Christ, it's once and forever. All who come to God by Jesus Christ stand and come on the ground of his steadfast love, his mercies. When you lead people to Jesus... And every time you come to Jesus, remember that you're coming to a mercy seat. Paul, who had a great knowledge and depth of all the understanding of the Old Testament types and pictures, he knew better than most people of his generation all the details of the tabernacle, and often in ways that we don't realize. He's often, when he's writing, he's, he's alluding to that Old Testament system. I believe that in, in those glorious words in the last part of Romans 8, Paul very much has Jesus Christ as the mercy seat in his mind. You just read that in the light of the mercy seat. Romans 8, 33 to 34. Who will bring a, a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who also intercedes for us. Just look at that. It's the picture of the high priest who's gone into the heavenly tabernacle with his own blood to make intercession for us. And then the next words take you right to the mercy seat, the steadfast covenant love of God. Verse 35 through to 39. Who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, 
nakedness, peril, or sword. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, which is in Christ Jesus our mercy seat. Nothing can snatch you away. The mercy seat, the steadfast love, the loving kindness of God towards His own. That's the grace and the glory of Jesus Christ. That is what Jesus Christ has been made unto us. And, and, and I don't know if you're just not amazed at times at God's steadfast love for Israel. If you can't really get your head around it and say, well, how could God love me? Just look at God's steadfast love for Israel. You only have to read that long record of their history in Psalm 106 and Psalm 107. They're very long psalms. And it's a long, long story of Israel's failures and how they kept stumbling and messing up. But it's also a long, long story of the steadfast love of God, which is so much bigger and greater and higher than they were. How often those people disappointed the Lord. Any little problem or trial or test came along, they turned against God. It seemed at times that they were just sitting waiting for some silly little opportunity to grumble against the Lord. Bearing in mind what Israel were and what they really were, I, I'm just even more amazed at the whole episode with Balaam. Balak of Moab called for Balaam, paid him good money to come and curse Israel. And you might think if there were any people who deserved to be cursed at that time, it was Israel. People who had known the kindness, the steadfast and the covenant love of God. People who had known the mighty deliverance of God. People who had known the supernatural provision. They would seen signs and wonders beyond counting. God's chosen people, and yet they despised it all. But in Numbers 23, Balaam comes to try and curse Israel. But the curse couldn't come out of his mouth. He had to say, God has commanded me to bless. How can I curse? What did Balaam say, or rather, what did God say through Balaam's mouth about these people? These people who as recently at Numbers 4 and 16 a couple of chapters earlier had been grumbling and moaning and going on about God. God speaking through Balaam says of these people, Numbers 23 verse 21, God has not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord God is with him and the shout of a king is among them. What does this mean? Does it mean that God is blind? No, there's plenty of iniquity in Israel. But God says, I've not beheld iniquity in Jacob. There's a lot of perverseness and rottenness. But God says, I haven't seen any perverseness. Why does he speak like that? Because he's looking at Israel through the mercy seat. And he's being true as he, as he looks at Israel through the picture of the mercy seat. He's looking with His covenant love for them. If you really love somebody, you, you usually make a lot of excuses for their behavior and their failures. If someone else points out the failures or the wrongs of the one you love, well, you say, yeah, it's true, but. But you don't really know. You cover up the faults because you are loyal to them. Loyalty is a very great virtue. And I wish we Christians at, at times were a little bit more loyal than we are. <laughs> because we, we really do need to be loyal to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. 
And Christians with a religious spirit are, are often the least loyal people on the face of the earth. You can walk in some sort of relationship for years, but like Israel, it's like they're always just waiting for you to put a foot wrong so they can rip you to pieces. Loyalty. I said last week, what I'd say, good manners is a good thing, but loyalty is also a very good thing. And, and we often say, well, love is blind. True love is not actually blind. True love sees it all. True love sees everything. But true love loves in spite of everything. And that's the steadfast love of God. He knows exactly. He knows every detail. And yet, still loves us with true love. And, and what a picture the whole Balaam thing is for us. Here this man comes along who's been paid to curse God's people. Right at the time when they deserve to be cursed. And anyone with a religious spirit would say, well, amen, brother Elam, uh, Balaam, sorry, go for it. They deserve the worst curse you can think of. They deserve it. But God says to him, you can't do it because of the mercy seat. We are poor sinners. We can in, in no way accuse Israel ourselves. I've heard preachers at times lay into Israel in the wilderness and how rotten they were and how terrible they were, miserable they were. I could never do that because I know myself and I know I'm exactly like them. And God knows all about that and much more than we would ever know about ourselves. But with all His knowledge of us, He loves us with a steadfast love. The covenant love of, 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 for us of a covenant that's so much bigger and better than the one that Israel were under. And when this man could not curse them under that covenant, how much more so are we sealed and kept and protected under the love of a covenant that is so much better? And if we take that love even beyond us to the world, we see some of the most terrible things people do to each other. You don't need me to tell you what a wicked world we live in right now. Pictures coming out of Ukraine. There's states in America that are pushing now for abortion to be legal right up to the very moment of a woman giving birth. That you can abort, abort a child right up to, to five minutes before she goes into labor. In our own country, the, the corruption and the hatred and the wickedness just never seems to end. Man's great inhumanity and great wickedness. But despite that, John 3.16 still stands as it did 2,000 years ago. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And then God displayed Him publicly as a mercy seat. And can we ever reach the end of the wonderful fullness of this mercy seat? We find all the patience, the long-suffering, and the forbearance of God now in Jesus Christ. And it's not a low kind of wishy-washy love. Kind of love that doesn't care whether a person's bad or we just pretend that, that they're okay. That's why there are two cherubim over the mercy seat. And if you study the history of the cherubim, you'll see that they always relate to one thing, and they relate to the holiness of God. The first time you meet them is at the gate of the garden when man has sinned. Those cherubim say, man in his unholy state cannot now dwell in the presence of God. Something has to be done about it. When you get to the end of the Bible, you find redeemed man in the midst of the paradise of God. Yes, he's back in the garden because God has done something about it. The mercy seat has attended to the whole matter. The precious blood has made a full atonement for man's sin. And the point is that the cherubim always speak of the holiness of God. 
The cherubim in Isaiah's time are heard chanting over and over and over again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The Lord God Almighty. God's love is a holy love. But through the mercy seat, He lifts us up from our unholiness and takes us into His holiness. That blood on the mercy seat always speaks of the great price that God paid to redeem us from our unholiness. The mercy seat that we see on top of the Ark of the Covenant is just a poor shadow, a hazy picture of Jesus Christ, our true mercy seat. He is all and so much more than that symbol ever could represent. May God just give us a new appreciation of our Lord Jesus Christ as our personal mercy seat. Hebrews 10, 19 20, through to 22. We have confidence. You and me. We have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way. And since we have a high priest, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Hebrews 4.16 Again, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. That blood-sprinkled meeting place between man and God. Let us draw near with confidence to Jesus our mercy seat so that we may receive mercy and we may find grace in our time of great need. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 and 10 Because of the mercy seat you are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received the full measure of God's mercy. Romans 8 From verse 31, back to Romans 8. What then shall we say to these things? What can we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Who can be against us? Who shall bring a charge against us? God's elect. It is God who justifies. Who is He who condemns? It's Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God. Who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? And God would say this morning, let us therefore come boldly. Even as we break bread this morning, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. That we may obtain fresh mercy. Today's fresh mercy. And that we, even as we come and break bread together, may find grace. There's some with great needs here this morning. And you can come, God says, even as we come and break bread together we may find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. Let's stand and just pray briefly and then let's break bread together. Lord, the depth of your word is just beyond us at times. Just the consistency, how it all ties together, it all, all the pictures and everything that you did in the Old Testament is all fulfilled 
in Christ Jesus. What a picture you give us just in that one thing of the mercy seat. Where you speak, you reveal, you give grace in the midst of that, that place of your great glory of the cherubim, there's also found great grace. And then that picture becomes just huge. In Jesus Christ, who is now our seat of mercy. We can't even begin to fully grasp that. We don't even begin to fully plumb the depths of it. But God, I pray that by your Spirit, you give us a deeper and deeper and deeper revelation of Jesus Christ, my mercy seat. Thank you, Lord. Amen.